Good morning, everybody. Again, I'm Jessica Holofsky. I'm a research ecologist with the Forest Service Pacific Northwest Research Station and the University of Washington. And I've been working uh, primarily with national forests on climate change vulnerability assessments and adaptation for about the last 10 years with Dave here. And so we're going to do a, a bit of a paired presentation. I'm going to cover a lot of the, the physical science uh, and go into a little bit on hydrology and disturbance. And then Dave is going to cover more of the biological part with the forest ecology. All right, so I'm going to start with some recent statistics. So these are the 10 hottest years on record for the US. And you'll notice that many of them are in the last decade or so. Uh, 2018 wasn't considered here, it actually came in fourth, so it would be right in here. Um, and then the, this past July of 2019 was the hottest on record globally. So going more uh, to the local level here, these are records from SeaTac since 1948. Uh, and again, you see some patterns here with the, with the hottest years. And you've also probably noticed we've been having a bit more fire lately. Uh, in 2014, we had the largest fire in Washington's history, the Carlton Complex fire, which was over 250,000 acres. And then 2015, we had a very uh, hot and dry year, record low snowpacks. We had over 1.7 million acres burned in Oregon and Washington, um, and over 9 million burned in the western U.S. So this is a satellite image. You see the red spots are where there were active fires on August 30th of 2015. So we started in 1850 before the Industrial Revolution at about 260 part, parts per million and we're now at 409 parts per million. And you've all probably heard of something called the greenhouse gas effect and the, the greenhouse effect. So this is, a, this is a good thing. It keeps heat in our atmosphere and keeps the earth from getting too cold. But we have increased the concentration of greenhouse gases, and that's why we're seeing warming. So I wanted to talk about something called radiative forcing, which is how we're pushing our climate on the warming end. I mean, if you think of a, a Christmas light bulb, it's about 2.3 watts. So if you think about how we've changed the Earth's climate so far, that results in about one Christmas light every meter over the Earth's surface times 500 trillion over the entire surface of the Earth. Moving forward, it's going to be more like four of those light bulbs per meter squared. So one of the uh, scenarios for future greenhouse gas concentration is called the representative concentration pathway 8.5, which means we're going to have about uh, 8.5 watts per meter squared of warning, warming over the Earth's surface. So these are the records for global temperature going from 1880 through about 2017. Um, and you'll notice, again, some of our warmest years on record globally have been in, in the last decade or so. So these are uh, going, again, more locally to the Pacific Northwest, the temperature trends for all of our weather stations in the Pacific Northwest. So these have shown that our temperatures, on average, across the Pacific Northwest have increased by about one and a half degrees Fahrenheit since 1920. Um, so each of these circles represents a trend. The larger the circle, the larger the uh, increase or decrease in temperature. So the, the largest circles are about three and a half uh, degrees Fahrenheit warming. And you can see increases in temperature since 1920. Almost every station shows warming. Um, and the extreme cold temperatures in particular have become more rare. Um, so they, the, the lower temperatures have gone up at a more rapid rate than the ex extreme high temperatures. All right, so these are projections for the future. And we have a couple different scenarios uh, for future climate change. One of them is this RCP 8.5, that's the 8.5 watts per meter squared of warming. That's kind of our business as usual, worst case scenario. So this assumes that we do not significantly reduce our greenhouse gas emissions over time. 4.5 assumes that we do something fairly significant in terms of decreasing our greenhouse gas emissions. And so you can see they track pretty closely until about 2050. And that's when we see real 
divergence between these two different scenarios. Um, and with the, with the upper one, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 8 to 14 degrees uh, Fahrenheit increase in average annual temperature. So what about precipitation? So global climate models uh, unanimously agree that there's going to be warming with climate change. They are not so good at projecting future temperatures. And there's a lot of disagreement about what will happen with temperature trends with these global climate models. Uh, a lot of them project a small increase in winter uh, or even total annual precipitation in the Pacific Northwest. Most of them do not project increases in summer precipitation. So it's kind of a flip of the coin on that one. So what will, that, what will this future look like? So if we think in terms of average annual temperature, a place like Olympia will be more like Sacramento, California. So a review of, of what we know. We know there's a natural greenhouse effect. That's a good thing. But we're enhancing it with our greenhouse gas emissions. We, need, we have already seen effects of changing climate in the Pacific Northwest in the last several decades. And there will be more warming to come. So we know that these changes in climate will affect other ecosystem processes, including the hydrologic cycle the plant establishment, growth and mortality, we've already talked about that this morning, uh, and also disturbances, drought, fire, and insect outbreak. So starting with hydrology and our glaciers. So in the upper left-hand corner is South Cascade Glacier in 1928. And then this bottom right is that same area again in 2016. So we've seen nearly every glacier in the Cascades retreat over the last 100 years. In the North Cascades, the glacial area has decreased by about 46% since 1900. We've also seen trends across the western U.S. of decreasing snowpack. So these, this is similar to that other figure where we have the red showing uh, the linear trend in snowpack over time between 1955 and 2016. The larger the red circle, the larger the, the decrease in snowpack, whereas the blue circles are showing actual increases in snowpack. So we're seeing a lot of places that were historically dominated by snow are becoming more mixed rain and snow or actually rain dominated watersheds. And this is another look at that uh, for the Pacific Northwest specifically. And so this top figure shows the different types of watersheds, the green being rain dominant, red being mixed rain and snow, and the blue being snow dominant. And then these are the projections for the future for the 2040s and 2080s under, under two different future scenarios. And you can see a lot of that blue, those, those snow dominant watersheds disappear in those bottom figures. And we have a lot of shifts from the blue and red to more of the green, uh, rain-dominated watersheds. So how does this affect stream flow? So this is a hydrograph. This is for the Chehalis River here in our, in our neighborhood. This is for the um, hydrologic water year going from October through September over here. And then we have flow on the y-axis. And so these are, we have black is the historical patterns of stream flow and then projections for the future. And you can see they're not that different. The Chehalis watershed, this is a primarily rain dominated system. So the patterns of flow basically follow our precipitation patterns. So when we have October, November, December, January, you can see the flow goes up with our increased rainfall in the winter and then goes down in the summer when we have little, very little precipitation. And the next one. But this is for a different type of watershed. This is the Elwha River on the Olympic Peninsula. And this was a historically uh, transitional watershed, mixed rain and snow. So historically, you had some increase in, in flow with increases in precipitation. But then you can see it kind of goes flat there. And that's because a lot of the water was tied up in snowpack. And then with warming in the spring, that melts off and goes down in the summer months. With climate change, we're not going to have that water tied up in snowpack. So the flow increases more in the winter and then actually decreases faster 
and goes even lower in the summer. So this means two things. One, we can have more risk of flooding in the winter. So these are future pro projections of flood risk in the Pacific Northwest with the, with the larger red dots indicating more risk of flooding. And that's primarily happening in those, those watersheds that are shifting from snow and mixed to rain dominated. And we've already seen evidence of this. This was from 2009 when the, you probably remember part of I-5 was closed south of Olympia near Chehalis because of the flooding there. Um, and this can do, if you go to the next slide, a lot of damage to infrastructure. This is that same year. Um, it had a snowpack, then temperatures got very warm. It had rain falling on top of snow, which um, historically has resulted in some really big flood events and damage. Unfortunately, this also means that if the water runs off earlier in the summer, it's not tied off in snowpack, that we're going to have lower low flows in the summer months. And so these are projections for low flow risks in the Pacific Northwest. Again, they're going to be most significant where we have that transition, um, for, where we don't have the water tied up in snowpack where it has been historically. And with the increases in temperature uh, and the lower low flows in the summer, this will have negative impacts on our uh, aquatic habitat and is particularly stressful for our cold water adapted species like salmon. Uh, so this is historically, the, the background colors are air temperature, where when we get into this yellow and red range, it can even be fatal for salmon. Um, and these, the dots are all uh, stream temperature gauges. And so uh, you can see historically, Western Washington, pretty good place for salmon. Getting into the 2080s, there are some places in Western Washington where stream temperatures will be high enough to be at least stressful, if not uh, fatal, to cold water adapted fish species. So moving on to disturbance, other than flooding, we expect that these extreme weather events and increased disturbance is really going to be our primary challenge for forest management in the future. And it, you know, changes in the mean are one thing, but the changes in extreme events are really going to be what drives ecosystem change. So if we think of our standard bell curve here with distribution of events, where we have the average and then our tails here, our extreme high events, climate change could push going from something that happens maybe once every 40 years to an event that could happen one in every six years. And that's a big change for, for a disturbance regime in an ecosystem. And you've all probably noticed we've had some pretty dry summers around here for the last few years. We got a little bit of a reprieve this last year, but the years before that, uh, 2015, 2016, 2017, uh, this is August 25th of 2015, um, and all of Washington was either in a state of severe or extreme drought. In 2015, interestingly enough, is uh, a year that scientists say might be very similar to what we can expect in the future. We had a near normal precipitation over the course of the year, but the temperatures were very high, so very little of it was snowpack. I think snowpack was about 10 percent of normal on the, in the Olympics. Um, and then we had a very hot and dry summer, which led to a lot of fires burning. So potentially a, a harbinger of things to come. And we've also seen that uh, we had many days, most consecutive days without rain in Seattle in, in 2017. This is 2018. Again, these were precipitation levels over the summer in 2018. And we know from looking at reconstructions, this is from the Columbia River, that, that droughts actually were a lot more common historically. We just haven't seen those uh, extensive periods of severe drought uh, in our lifetimes. But this is, this is, these are all represent drought events that you can see can last for five to 10 years. Now when we know that warming temperatures and drought also affect insects. And so that little guy is a mountain pine beetle uh, it has been favored by uh, warmer temperatures that have allowed it to increase its reproductive rate in some locations. It's allowed it to expand into areas where it wasn't historically. And also, stressed trees 
are more susceptible to insect outbreaks. So drought, uh, very high density, low uh, vigor forests are more susceptible to insect outbreaks. And we've seen that uh, these are mountain pine beetle outbreaks since 1990 across the western U.S. and Canada. They've covered about 50 million acres. So uh, very extensively in lodgepole pine forests in British Columbia and also a lot of activity uh, in the Rocky Mountains and quite a bit in the east of the Cascades in Oregon and Washington. And this is from uh, Okanagan Wenatchee National Forest. So this is the number of trees killed in the millions over time. And you can see there was a pretty big increase in the last few decades in mountain pine beetle activity. So then moving on, how will climate change affect fire? We've seen some interesting events again in the last few years. This is some uh, Anacortis in August of 2016. And this is from New Halem in August of 2015. And then again, that, that tw year 2015, there were uh, over 1,500 fires in Washington that year. We had uh, suppression costs somewhere in the uh, area of $250 million, uh, and really large losses, especially in rural areas that were affected by these fires. But going back to this, this satellite image from August of 2015, we can expect more of these you know, regionally synchronous fire events. And that's because as we get warmer temperatures, we have more water evaporating from the landscape. We get large areas with very low fuel moisture, which means that whenever there's an ignition, the, the fire is going to start. So that was from Seattle in, in 2018, which, which actually wasn't from our regional fires. It's mostly from British Columbia and California. But more activity across the western U.S. is definitely going to increase smoke levels. And we're actually seeing some areas where we have reburns. So this is from, uh, this is Mount Adams here in the middle in southwest Washington. There is some areas in um, the Gifford Pinchel National Forest that have burned three times since 2008. You can see this red area is the area of overlap for those fires. And that, that's what one of those areas looks like at this point. And we also know that disturb these disturbances will interact. So we'll likely have interaction between insects and fire, uh, other pathogens and invasive species, uh, drought events. And that means there could be some, some surprises in the future with these interactions. So what are we expecting in terms of area burn? So these are projections for uh, at one degree Celsius, about two uh, degree Fahrenheit, increase in temperature. In most of the western U.S., that would be about, result in about two to three times higher annual area burned. And again, we know that there will be some, some interactions and uh, this combination of uh, different stressors is something we call uh, stress complexes. So this is an, an, an example for lodgepole pine where we can have higher temperatures, more severe and extended droughts, which, which could lead to increased uh, bark beetle outbreaks, also more stand replacing fire, um, which leads to mortality and, and potentially some changes in regeneration and also species composition, uh, including exotics. So in summary, we are fairly certain there are going to be higher temperatures, more wildfire, uh, less snow, and overall less water in the summer. We're not as certain about precipitation and what will happen with precipitation. We know there will be more extreme events, drought, wildfire, insects, and that these are likely to have the biggest effects on our ecosystems. The things may creep along for a while, but we expect some pretty large changes after about 2050. And there will likely be surprises. All right. Great. Thank you.